We're talking about Newton's second law today, also known as the law of inertia. Um, it's, it's appropriate that we, we begin this discussion by going through what the, the, the law actually says, but also tempering it with this idea that we tend to hide behind language sometimes. I've worked really hard through the beginning of the year to try and remind you that we should be precise with language and make sure we understand the specific vocabulary we're supposed to use. But we generally also hide behind language all the time. I kind of indicated that earlier in the year when I asked you, why do things fall to the ground? And we said gravity. Again, it's a word that has meaning. When, I, when we all say gravity, we all know what we mean, but we have no understanding of what makes something fall to the ground. We don't know why. We have a word for, the, for the, the natural law, but we don't know why. We don't know what's really happening. We have several words like that in our language. And we're going to talk about one of them today, uh, probably the, the most important one, which is what is a measurement of something's inertia? It's right there in Newton's second law. Newton's second law is best expressed in its mathematical form. which says that if you have an unbalanced force, then there will be an acceleration. And the size of that acceleration will depend on the inertia of the object. That's what this states. The direction of the unbalanced force is the direction of the acceleration. So it's appropriate to understand that, although I talked about the fact that an object can have two different components to its acceleration, tangential and radial, that either way, there's still just one unbalanced net force. That means when you add all the forces together, whatever direction they point, that will be the direction of the acceleration. So the first thing I want you to have in your notes that's kind of important is that unbalanced force or net force is always in the direction of the acceleration. and vice versa. The acceleration always has to be in the direction of the net force. Um, I don't want to get too technical here, but everybody understand what the word net means here? To sum up, to add up. So when we're talking about the word net, we are talking about like adding up a whole bunch of things and whatever the result is we say is a net. Uh, so net force is the sum of all the forces. Now, if that equals zero, then there is no acceleration. Like I said before, Newton's first law and second law sound redundant, and in many ways they are. If you add up all the forces and you get zero, then you get the conditions of the first law, which means the object's velocity won't change. But if you have an unbalanced force, then the object's velocity will change. The proportionality constant here is the mass. And, and this is where I want to have a critical discussion about what mass is, because I think you have a definition of mass. But I think that your definition of mass is probably, um, well, let's just say it's interesting. You guys made it through science for, for 12 years because many of you had it in preschool. Things with mass have inertia. And the more mass they have, the more inertia they have. Now we're going to come back to that. We're going to circle back to that. There's something else that mass does that we can measure. You may not know this one, but I told you about it three weeks ago. So it would be in your notes on the first day that I introduced forces. Well, I don't want to wait all day for this. So I'm a little sad, but I said that things with mass create gravity and things with mass experience gravity. So you can tell if an object has mass if it experiences the force of gravity. And you can tell if an object has mass if it creates gravity. That's how you can tell something has mass. There's two ways.
two ways you can tell something has mass. It has inertia, that's one way, and it creates and experiences gravity, that's another way. We did not know that mass did both of these things throughout all the time that we've been studying science. Just to be aware, for a long time, we thought there was two separate things. There was inertia, one measurement, and there was mass, a different measurement. One of them had to do with gravity, one of them had to do with resistance to changes in motion. It took experiments to show that they were the same thing. This one's easy to do. It's Newton's second law. Apply a force to something and see what its acceleration is. If I do that, I can predict its mass. This is how you measure the mass of an astronaut in space. You apply a force to them and see what their resulting acceleration is. Astronauts have to take their mass every day to ensure they're not having bone loss while they're in space. So they sit on a special table that shakes them, applies a force to them back and forth, and measures their acceleration. That measurement is used to determine their mass. Now, how do you know if something creates gravity? You can tell if something experiences gravity because you drop something, right? But it's the idea that it creates and experiences gravity. Uh, Cavendish had the answer to that. Now, I, we can't do this in my classroom. We could, but it would take all the space in the room. He took a room about uh, a little bigger than this, and he, <laughs> he basically bought from a, a um, smelter four incredibly large iron spheres. Two of them he fixed on the floor. Two of them he attached together with a rod and then suspended that rod at the midpoint from the ceiling. So it could spin this way and that way. All right? Now, what he did was, and, and this is fascinating because he did this like 250, 300 years ago. He wanted to prove one of Newton's laws. So he suspended it in the room, took these spheres, which he put on like skateboards, put them far away. And he waited until this um, barbell came to rest somewhere in the room. So let me uh, do one more thing. And then he, we would do this with a laser, but he did it by putting a, um, a mirror right at the middle. And he just shone a flashlight, you know, on the mirror. He didn't have a flashlight either. He used like a candle. And it reflected off of that and struck a spot on the wall really far away. The effect of gravity isn't huge when you don't have something that's as big as the Earth. So then he rolled these spheres into place. And when he did, an interesting thing took place. These balls moved a little bit, and the light moved along the wall. And he was able to do two things that are important. First, he was able to show that there was a force of attraction. He had to do it symmetrically so that the thing that was hung wouldn't swing one way or the other. But he was also able to measure the proportionality constant between mass and the gravitational force, something we haven't talked about yet this year. Um, his experiments nailed the value of the proportionality constant that we actually still use today. So with all of our more advanced techniques of doing this, he got it right with his experiment. And it's a difficult to measure thing because there's so much interference with the earth and air and stuff, but we still use the value that he calculated in this experiment. The Cavendish experiment proves that mass creates gravity and mass experiences a gravitational force. But Cavendish was also able to say that mass, the same measurement for mass that is about gravity is also about inertia. So it's an interesting thing that mass is that important in the universe. There are other intrinsic properties like charge that seem important. Mass is probably 
I won't say more important, but it's, it's more critical to the fabric of nature. I'd argue that all these things work together, but mass serves two purposes in nature. And that's how you know if something has mass or not. It either resists changes in its motion and or it creates gravity. It obeys both experiments. There are things in nature that don't do these things and therefore aren't mass. All right. I do want to, to, to talk further about that, but I don't, think, I don't think it's valuable time. I want to talk mostly about Newton's second law. Newton's second law is one that you should have been expecting because we've been talking about the first law for a while. The only difference between what we've been doing with Newton's first law and Newton's second law is that our net force isn't going to sum to be zero any longer. Our net force could be unbalanced. And when it is unbalanced, there is an acceleration experienced by the object. So from now on, we're going to have to start taking a closer look at how we apply a coordinate system to our problems. Because I'll remind you, the only thing that really changed in our set of steps is that at one point or another in the set of steps, you're asked to put a coordinate system out, you know, out there on your, your diagram, and you had two priorities. Priority number one was trying to line up one of your directions with the direction of the acceleration, and one of your priorities was to try and line it up with as many forces as possible. Once we start having accelerations, you're going to have to really discriminate between those two priorities, which means trying to figure out what the direction of the acceleration is. That's not always going to be convenient for the direction of the forces, but it's something you will have to do. Let's see how this works in practice because we've done so many of these problems at this point. I don't really think that we have to spend a lot of time analyzing things since we've done them so often. Let's do this one. And, and let's make this one super simple for the time being. Let's say the coefficient of kinetic friction is zero and the coefficient of static friction is zero, so there's no friction in this problem. And we take and apply a 20 newton force at an angle of 30 degrees to a uh, 10 kilogram box. This is going to be an unbalanced force. Can you already see it? With no friction in place, this box is going to experience an acceleration. There's no doubt in my mind. Is there a doubt in your mind? So this is our first foray into a Newton's second law problem. In a Newton's second law problem, we still do all of the same things we've been doing. We draw a free body diagram that indicates all the forces acting on the object. So I'll start with the downward force of gravity. I'm going to draw a sideways force due to the, uh, the applied force on the object. Uh, not doing a great job of making those particularly proportional, so let's do a better job. That's a little bit better job. And there's going to be a normal force due to the surface. And that's it. Now, my applied force is at an angle, but is there anybody in the room who doubts the fact that the object is going to slide that way? Right, my force isn't big enough to lift up the object, so I don't see it being scurried off into space. I'm pretty sure it's just going to slide along the ground. Does that seem reasonable? This is the kind of thought process you should make. You need to try and identify the direction of motion of the object, and more than just the direction of motion, the direction of the acceleration. This one's dull and easy. They won't always be so. So contemplate what's been doing or what's happening to your object and make some concessions as to what you should do for your directions. I'm going to make this way the direction of the positive x direction because it's aligned with the direction of the acceleration. And I'm going to make this way the y direction because it's perpendicular to the x direction. Again, I'm doing the same set of steps. This is the only point where I stop and I have to think about my priorities. And so I'm thinking about my priorities here. My priorities is to align the system with the direction of the likely acceleration. Then I can break my force up into its components. 20 cosine 30 degrees, 20 sine 30 degrees. I can apply 
Newton's law. And here, be careful as well, because this is the only other thing that's different. When I apply Newton's law now, one of them is going to be ma, and one of them is going to be zero. That's because of our priorities. Our priority was to line one direction up with the acceleration so that the other direction would still sum to be zero. The y direction is the one that sums to be zero because we set the x direction in the direction of the acceleration. Again, the only change for the second law is that we have an acceleration, but that change does come with things we have to be considerate about. Once that's done, everything else is the same. 20 cosine 30 degrees equals ma. And 20 sine 30 degrees plus normal minus 100 equals 0. When you are done with a Newton's law problem and you've done the, I'm sorry, when you're done with the force concept uh, model, Again, you're going to be left with a couple of relationships. I'll remind you that Newton's law still can only tell you two things. They can tell you the value of a single force, or they can tell you the acceleration. We didn't have acceleration as a possible thing in, the last, in our last portion discussion because we we're dealing with first law, but now acceleration is a possibility. You could find the acceleration of our object. I mean, it's right there, isn't it? Acceleration is going to be... 20 cosine 30 degrees divided by 10. Looks like, what, 17.6 meters per second squared? Is that right? No, that's not right. 17.26? 1.7, oh, I got the power of 10 wrong. 1.7, I forgot to divide by 10 meters per second squared. Mr. Shelton, should have done better. Should have done better. Looking over the other side though, um, we can do more than this, right? We could find the size of the normal force, so I'm not sure if that's necessary or not. But we can still do it. 20 sine 30 is 10, so normal force 90. Again, I don't know what the question mark was, right? I didn't ask a question. The force concept model is a way of analyzing a system. We have analyzed the system. The question could be any number of things. For example, what if the question was, how long does it take until the object's going 10 meters per second? That could be a question, right? We have an acceleration. We could assume it starts from rest and figure out the time it takes to get there. Be aware that now that we have accelerations, and that could be a part of your answer, you might be given motion equation information and either have to use it someplace, or when you're done with your force concept model, you might have to get the acceleration and use it for a kinematics problem. That's a pretty standard thing that you'll have to do. Let me show you another example. I have a surface that has a coefficient of kinetic friction of 0.3. I slide a block along that surface and give it an initial velocity of 5 meters per second. The block has a mass of 2 kilograms. How far does it go until it comes to rest? Now, if you don't know where to begin, because we haven't done a problem that sounds like this in a long time, I'll remind you, Newton's laws can tell you either a force or an acceleration. Would an acceleration help you solve this problem? I think it would. We have an initial velocity. We're being asked about delta x, 
we know the final velocity has got to be zero because it says come to rest. If we had an acceleration, that would solve this problem. This does seem like a problem that could be solved if we knew the acceleration. Newton's laws can tell us an acceleration. Ready to go? This one's pretty easy. Can you draw a free body diagram for your box? Be careful, there's only three arrows here. Don't make a silly mistake. Are you done yet? How many of you have a downward arrow? It's a good call. Why would you even look around to see if anybody else raises their hands? That one's simple. Anybody have an upward arrow? Is your upward arrow bigger, smaller, the same size as your downward arrow? Same size, good job. Good job. Anybody have an arrow to the right? Good, because I drew an arrow to the right, and I was afraid somebody here would draw an arrow to the right, but is there an arrow to the right? No, that's velocity, and we don't put velocity on a force, on a free body diagram. Anybody have a, an arrow to the left? That seems very reasonable. There's gonna be an arrow to the left, about a third of the size of the normal force, right? 0.3 times the normal force. So I'm going to put a coordinate system on here. I'm going to try and line one of them up with the horizontal. Now, this is where I want to be careful. I'm going to make this plus x. This is a minus x. This is plus y, minus y. Net force in the x direction equals ma. Net force in the y direction equals zero. I want the acceleration, but right now all I've got is friction equals ma. Not great. But in the y direction, I have normal equals mg, which equals 20. Do you think we could find the frictional force from that? I think so. Friction equals 0.3 times 20, right? Now, I know you have to leave, but while you're packing up, you can get the acceleration, that's no problem. Right, set that equal to six. The mass was two, so the acceleration has to be three meters per second squared. But we made the left positive in this problem. That means my five meters per second, I have to make that negative, right? Have to be consistent. So make the five negative. My acceleration is three. I think now you have enough information to figure out the displacement.